to Dr Nigel Farrow who's going to talk to us about his very personal journey that he mentioned on the, on the video. His CV, his CV is in our bulletin, it's well worth a read and you've seen the, seen the, um, um, the video so I'll try and restrict myself to just a couple of highlights. Dr Farrow entered the medical profession when his daughter Ella was diagnosed more than 10 years ago with cystic fibrosis. And from the beginning, he has had this single focus of being part of developing a cure for this disease. Nigel actually gave up a career in the music industry and began seven years of study, obtaining a Bachelor of Medical Science at Flinders University and a Bachelor of Health Science and a PhD in Medicine at the University of Adelaide. Nigel has received a number of prestigious awards and they are listed in the bulletin. Now a medical scientist and part of the Adelaide Cystic Fibrosis Airway Research Group, Nigel is helping to find a cure for this disease. His research is focused on correcting the genetic cause of cystic fibrosis uh, in, the, in one's airways. There's a good description in the bulletin so, and, and it is exciting because you'll see at the end of that description that there's the potential of providing a means to prevent this cystic fibrosis disease with a single treatment early in life that will last the lifetime of the patient. I'm sure Nigel's going to tell us more about that. Finally, his work has been accepted and published in the, in, um, in the greater scientific community through peer-reviewed scientific journal publications, which I might add are a measure of the esteem in which he is held. So please help me give a warm Rotary Club Adelaide welcome to Dr Nigel Farrow. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. I'd also like to thank the organisers for inviting me to attend the event for such a lovely lunch. I'd like to also thank every one of you here today and uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak and share my experience. Uh, today I'm going to give you a talk entitled Cure for CF, A Very Personal Journey to Find a Cure. So cystic fibrosis, what is it? That is the question my wife and I were forced to ask when we were told that Ella had CF. The answer broke our heart and the world as we knew it. So CF, what is it? It's a, re it's a recessive genetic disease, which simply means that two faulty copies of the gene were inherited, one from the father and one from the mother. It leads to a faulty protein. Sometimes the protein, protein is not present at all. But essentially, it changes the way chloride and uh, sodium um, function in the cells of organs that have epithelial linings, such as the lungs. It is a multi-organ disease, however the digestive system and the respiratory system are hit the hardest. In the last couple of decades there's been a breakthrough in medications for the dietary side of things which in part help. Unfortunately it means Ella needs to take anything up to about 40 tablets a day just to digest food. And she's a, quite a competitive little one and while we are in London having a, a large Christmas lunch she was proud to tell us she had broken a record. She had 28 tablets in one meal just to digest, digest that food. But nothing can be done at present for the respiratory problem and it is left with a lining of very, very sticky mucus that cannot be moved, coughed up or expelled. So essentially it's providing the perfect breeding ground for bacteria which can, cannot be uh, coughed up and got rid of. But what did this mean for Ella's future? Endless medications daily for life hours of physiotherapy daily for life, many hospital stays and at best a slow but progressive deterioration of her respiratory system. At worst, a very fast destruction of her lungs. This is the time bomb that we live in fear of every day. Every time we hear a cough, no matter where she is in the house, alarm bells go off like an air raid siren. Is this the beginning of one of those days? Every infection that lands her in high school could be the beginning of a very quick end. 
Recently, the youngest child on the transplant, lung transplant list in Australia was a four-year-old with CF. Within 24 hours of Ella being diagnosed, reality hit us very hard. She was rushed into critical care. She was losing weight rapidly. Her lungs had collapsed. Her little body was starting to fail. But Ella at 10 weeks of age was in her first battle, the first of many to come. This was the moment our world imploded and with it every hope for the future. But we were aware we had to be strong and hold fast as we had a beautiful little girl that needed us and needed us really badly. So where to from here? We realised that in putting back the pieces, we had an opportunity. We had a really unique opportunity to put the pieces back in a way that we wanted to, in a way that could be productive, a way that could help Ella. So starting over, we decided to the new hope. Together my wife and I decided then and there that we were going to cure this disease or die trying. That day Karen and I both stopped full-time work and developed a plan of attack for what lay ahead. Karen became Ella's full-time carer, taking care of the day-to-day -day treatments and looking after the household, including Ella's eldest daughter, Araya. I went back to university to study medical science. The reality of that first year of study was extremely challenging. However, I was very fortunate that halfway through, I fell in love with science and medicine. So it was full steam ahead, 18 hours a day, seven days a week for four years straight. But that was just to get to the start of my PhD and full-time st laboratory studies. So then there was another three and a half years of long hours and many weeks away from the family doing research, visiting CF labs and doctors and professors overseas. But after seven and a half years of study, I obtained two bachelor degrees and a PhD in medicine. A professor who I respected highly and has helped me guide me through said to me on my graduation day, congratulations on obtaining, on obtaining your doctorate. You are now at the starting line and the hard work really begins now. So what exactly is my research? Basically what we're looking at is being a recessive disease, there's two faulty genes. If we can get one good copy of that gene into a cell, essentially that cell is then cured. So what we do is use a vector that we have pulled apart, put back together, and essentially use as a vehicle to transport the gene into the cell, into the genome. So that way, if we can get into enough cells of the lungs, the idea is to cure the lungs of cystic fibrosis. But seeing how much time Ella spends in hospital, I could see that our body turns over. Um, as the skin cells die, they are replaced. The same with the lungs. And I thought, how can we do this as a one-off treatment? It, it doesn't make, didn't make sense. As these cells are replaced, they're replaced by adult stem cells, which reside in all of our organs, including the lungs. So I thought, and what I'm trying to achieve now, if we can cure that cell, as it replenishes the lungs, every daughter cell is also cured. The goal is for a one treatment for a lifetime. But the lack of funding and the way funding was, the direction of funding was going in Australia meant that the research journey would have to come to an end here in Australia for us. So we started the process to move overseas. I had lined up some work. I had a choice between moving to the United States or our preference to London. But then a lifeline was handed to us from the Cure for CF Foundation, and they provided funds for my research and wages for the first year after my PhD. Currently, I am on six-month contracts with no guarantee beyond those six months. Basically, to stay in South Australia, this is the way it will always be. This is the nature of medical research funding in this country. But South Australia is our home, a part of us, a part of our family. So we decided to try and stay for as long as we possibly could. We began working more with the QFCF Foundation to raise further funds. But this meant the wish for our family to remain anonymous was taken away from us. The stress on us has been incredible, but not nearly as much as those living with this insidious disease. So we will continue to do all we can to raise awareness and funds through the QFCF Foundation, because I truly believe we have a path to a cure for CF-related airway disease, and the only thing that dictates the speed in which we travel down this path is the funding. It has now been 11 years since we started this journey, 
other pieces of our world back, world back together? In short, no. Four weeks ago, Ella came down with another lung infection, the specific infection which is particularly nasty for CF patients. She went back into hospital to have an IV inserted and around the clock treatments. After a week, she came home with her IV still attached and twice daily visits from the nurse. Another week went by and she had the IV removed and is now on multiple treatments that take anything up to three to four hours every single day in an effort to try and eradicate this infection. It's a particularly hard thing for myself and my wife Karen to watch her go through once again, but worse is knowing that it isn't the last and will become more and more frequent until the ine inevitable conclusion to this disease is upon us. The fact remains that Ella at 11 years of age has a small chance of making it into her 30s and will likely face the need for a lung transplant before then. However, through the generous donations and fundraising support from individuals and organisations such as Rotary, we are getting closer and closer to a cure and I will not stop until that day, the day I often dare to dream about, the day we can say we did it, we have the cure for cystic fibrosis. Thank you very much. Nigel has kindly agreed to, uh, to, to take questions. So first hand up gets the first question. Ms. Tom. Thank you for a, a most interesting and uh, important talk. Can you tell us how your research links up with the research that is carrying on in London and I think in the United States? There's several different streams of research going on around the world and um, there has been one through the United States which has led to kind of a breakthrough um, in treatment. However, it only helps about three to four percent of those with this disease because there's very many different mutations and types. It's extremely costly. Um, it won't be funded by the government at the moment because there's not a, um, a benefit to cost ratio. Uh, we're talking the cost of uh, three, four hundred thousand dollars a year per family. The thing I like about the research we're doing, we're putting a gene in there. It will fix. It is designed to fix all types of this disease across the board. The research going on in London at Imperial College by um, a fantastic professor, Eric Alton, who I've got to know rather well, is pretty much the same research we are doing. It is exactly the same research. We're using a specific lentiviral vector. They are using a different one. With a few tweaks, we're basically coming at the same problem the same way, just with a little, a little few, a few little differences. But those little differences may make a whole difference. Um, we thought rather than completely collaborating and having one shot, we'll have two shots. So we have th those guys over there. They've announced recently they're looking at going to clinical trials as well. So. Um, um, They've also done a clinical trial with a non-viral and it showed proof of principle in humans that this can work. We just need to get it there. Pete's, uh, just repeat the person then. You, Pete. Thanks, Nigel. Um, thank you for inspiring us to work with Linda and Kerry and the team for Trailblazer, uh, the fun funds that were raised to help find that cure. Mm -hmm. um, two things. Firstly, one of the uh, ideas that we, we came across when we've been discussing this cure for CF is the affinity or the issue of salt water and the positive impact on people with CF about swimming and you know being in this near the sea. And you might like to just elaborate on that. And a question on behalf of the very accomplished tuba player at the back of the room. What form of music did you give up to take on the scientific work that you do? Uh, to answer the second question first, I, um, I started out um, young as a teenager in the music industry. It was all those, uh, back in those days in the 70s, it was all rock and roll and that sort of thing. As I got older, I went more into blues, jazz, classical. Once I started teaching on the side, it became obvious the more you, could, the more you knew, the more genres you could play, the more 
uh, students you had. So through necessity that way, I diversed as much as I could. Uh, to be honest with you, my heart, uh, my heart's, the only thing I really ever play at the moment is classical and a little bit of blues. Um, to come back to the salt water side of things, it's uh, not so much the salt water, well, a part of the salt water is if you're out there in the salt water, you're doing something physical. Any sort of physical activity is helpful in keeping anybody healthy. But importantly, one of Ella's treatments she does twice a day is in her, it's similar to the old asthma uh, ventilators where she'll breathe in and out. And that is um, a 5% hypertonic saline solution. It's essentially salty air. Because this disease is a chloride channeled uh, malfunctioning disease, the linings of your lung, the liquid lining, is vastly reduced, which means it's a sticky mess, the cilia, the little hairs that beat and move everything around, they get stuck in it, they don't move. It's because the ions or the salt and chloride are caught in the cell, so water rushes in to try and equal that out. So you put saltiness, salty air into the lungs, there's more salt in that mucus, it can draw some of the water back out. So then naturally, if you're down by the ocean and you're breathing in the natural salty air, it's a benefit. Thank you. Um, just quickly, the Rotary um, Health Foundation sponsors people like yourself. Have you ever applied to the Rotary uh, Health Foundation for uh, funding? I'll be honest with you, I wasn't aware of it, and it's something I'm going to make a phone call after this because my father has uh, been in the Rotary for a long time in Queensland and has never mentioned it. Well, the number of us <laughs> donate to that regularly each year, and I suggest that perhaps you, through Barry or someone, you may make an application for funding. So although I was saying my father hadn't mentioned this, maybe that's where when he one day handed me over a cheque that Rotary had passed on, that's where it had come from and I hadn't paid attention. So thank you. I'm just going to follow on from that. Um, I, my, I'm a member of the Rotary Club of Adelaide now, but I was a member of the Rotary Club of Wakefield. One of our former presidents became district governor and district governor, you know, other Rotary district in the state, 952 and Ian Oliver. Ian and his wife had a son who had CF and died not long after I joined that, that club. So, but more importantly, he was chairman of the Rotary Health Research Foundation for five years. So a phone call I'm going to make when I leave here, I'm going to get your business card and give him a call. He, I don't think he's in that role anymore, but he certainly um, is very familiar with the Rotary Health Research Foundation. Uh, and he will be able to enlighten me and I can hopefully share that with you. Thank you. Thank you. Is the research based in, uh, embedded in a hospital or in a university department? Uh, because there you might actually get into structure that would support you and you would have a platform from which you could actually apply for funds from NHMRC or the Australian uh, Research Foundations. We, um, we're embedded in both. I'm employed by uh, the University of Adelaide. However, I'm, I've been based and I've always been based at the Women's and Children's Hospital. So we have within our team both hospital employees and the university. So we do have that infrastructure behind us. Uh, every year we apply for NHMRC grants. We have been lucky in the past. Uh, several years ago, we received nearly a million dollars in funding for one of our streams of our research, um, which is coming to a conclusion soon. Um, the unfortunate thing with the NHMRC process, about uh, 10 to 11% of the projects that are deemed worthy of funding actually get funding. The funding here in Australia and across the board or around the world um, from the government, they're doing what they can, but it's just, there's just not enough money to go around. So we supplement that with um, applying for grants from smaller foundations. You know, we'd have all heard of the, the hospital foundation they held every year with their uh, lottery tickets, those sorts of things. They can provide, I have a small grant to do a small study at the moment from those guys. It's just, I spend probably a third of my time not doing research or even doing the backbones of the research, the reading and that. It's doing the admin work to try and apply for grants. And so you know, we, do, we do everything we can across the world and not only here in Australia, there's foundations in America, in the UK, Europe, we apply to anything and everything. This is the last one. Uh, you were mentioning the, the technique that you're working on. 
has other applications for other diseases. Yes. I presume you're using CRISPR as your vector, but can you enumerate some of those other diseases that might be? Well, just to correct on that one, we, the technique we're using predates the CRISPR technique. I am very, very familiar with the CRISPR-Cas9 technique you talk of. To get that to work, and this comes to um, my personal understanding and views on it, to get that to work, you need to deliver those things to a cell. To deliver those things to a cell, you need a vector. So that's where we come in. We're actually at the forefront of using a vector. So we've essentially taken a virus similar to the herpes virus, the HIV virus. While these viruses are very nasty, they inject their payload into our genome. So all of a sudden, our body, our cells have that gene in it. They're quite a uh, crafty little bugger because they then make our body make more viruses. What we've done is pulled it apart, turned all that off, so all it does now is put into your genome the gene we dictate, whether that can be a marker gene to track where things are going or inevitably the right CFTR gene. So there is the, the CRISPR stuff out there. My personal belief is I'm sticking on the road we're going. I feel it's um, 20 years further down the track um, and uh, that's where my bet is. When it comes to other diseases, as soon as we've got this sorted in the lungs, most lung diseases will be able to treat with this. There's other parts of the body that CF affects, the pancreas and that. I've also started looking into that. Essentially, once we get this going, we'll start looking at the brain, the heart, the liver, the pancreas, any organ, anything that needs putting in there. We, can, we use it in the, the lungs because well, the way we use it, we take the coating of the virus and change it so it matches receptors that are on the cells in the lungs. We can really simply, and when we put this virus together daily in the lab, we can put a different coat on it, and it could be, well, here's the coat for the brain, here's the one for the heart. I mean, I'm simplifying it here, but I really believe this, is, this really has the potential of being a new way, a, a different way of doing medicine than we've ever had, and a way of, of curing things at a genetic level. We have, our approach at the moment is to fix things and to try and alleviate symptoms. This is a way of trying to fix things before they even create a symptom. When I first looked at it, I thought this is too good to be true. And I come up with this from an idea I saw watching a lecture in my second year on how HIV works. And when they explained the way it goes backwards into the genome, I thought, could it be as simple as that? I went home to look it up. There was two groups in the world looking into that very thing. One of them was here in Adelaide, my hometown. And I thought, how much of a coincidence is that? The next day I made a phone call. Um, I sent an email. I didn't get a reply. I did it every six months until the professor finally got sick of me and thought, you better come in and have a chat. I now work for that professor. <laughs> so I, I do believe this is a, a really, has the potential of really being a new way of medicine in the future and will be. No worries. Can you stay for a few minutes after this? Yes, I can. Okay. No worries. Thank you. Please, please stay here for a minute. Okay. <clears throat> Nigel, thank you for a very personal speech, which we all felt, I'm sure, was stimulating to say the least. I think it's true to say that all of us are keen to do what we can for our children, but your sacrifice and dedication to helping your daughter Ella and other cystic fibrosis sufferers is truly inspiring. To all of you, don't forget to make a donation to Trailblazer by the Sea number four and to nominate Cure for CF as your supported beneficiary. If you have any troubles with our website and, and seeking to do that, talk to Adri or Tom or Pete or Simon Drew or, as a last resort, me. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, may I, on behalf of all of us, wish Ella and you, Nigel, and your wife, all the very best for the future. Thank you.